and welcome. Nice to see you all here tonight um, and uh, on this auspicious day. Um, everybody knows what day this is, I'm sure. We've had it in Radio Ulster since very, very early on this morning. Um, it is uh, World Stretch a Joke Too Far Day. Um, from now on, I just want it to be known that I have decided to counter uh, May the 4th uh, with June 18, um, which... Uh, does anybody remember Cockney Rebel? Steve Harley, Cockney Rebel. Eamon Hughes is nodding his head. Uh, well, you'll know that June 18 uh, trades in the same um, lexical proximity uh, to Judatine. Judatine, um, great Cockney Rebel song of 1974, as um, May the 4th does to May the Force. So from now on, I've decided uh, that every June 18 shall be Judatine Day. Um, she took us on the carousel. She smiled and oh, how we laughed. She made us happy, as Steve Harley told us in 1974. So people, we can do this together. We can make every June 18 uh, global world uh, glam rock day. So we'll do that. I, I, I propose we start that on June 18. We all reconvene and we go on the carousel and we smile and oh how we'll laugh and it'll make us happy <laughs> well some of us perhaps <laughs> anyway thank you for coming this evening um and to this uh wonderful occasion i'm so 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 proud and pleased to be in, uh, able to stand here and to introduce um our two distinguished fulbright scholars um they come to us every year, but I think this year we are particularly uh, blessed and uh, um, by the presence of Marilyn Richterich and by Tess Taylor. Um, so they're going to read tonight. They're going to they're going to read. Uh, Marilyn's going to read, and uh, and then I'll introduce uh, Tess. Um, Marilyn is no stranger to Belfast. Um, Actually, it occurred to me recently that um, I have probably seen Marilyn more in Belfast than most of the people who I went to school with uh, in the last 10 years. And uh, if I'm not running into her in person, then um, I'm running into her in print. Um, just before Christmas, I was, uh, I was reading again um, uh, the wonderful uh, Stepping Stones, um, Dennis O'Driscoll's uh, book of interviews with Seamus Heaney. And uh, I was... Uh, Turn to page 416. Turn to page 416, and uh, and there was Dennis O'Driscoll, uh, and and there were Seamus and uh, Dennis O'Driscoll in conversation uh, about Marilyn, uh, and um, this isn't entirely to be unexpected. Um, uh, uh, Marilyn's first introduction to Irish literature was in a class she was saying with uh, with Seamus Heaney, um, and. Uh, she, she did write her first book, was um, uh, uh, Acting Between the Lines, a history of the first five years of the Field Day Company. Can it be a history of the first five years? Can that, is, that, is that a history or is that just like the first five years of... Anyway, we spoke about Field Day, published in 1994, which seems hardly likely, but true. Um, and in recent years, it's been Stuart Parker that Marilyn's name has uh, perhaps most associated with. Um, I've got to tell you, before I go on to talk about Stuart Parker and Marilyn, we were talking about Seamus Heaney when we were at dinner uh, before we came here, and uh, Marilyn was telling me that on one visit to um, when she was in Oxford um, a number of years ago, uh, she took a train trip um, up to Orkney. Uh, thinking she wasn't going to do anything at all associated with literature. And uh, it turned out that Seamus Heaney was there that day doing a reading. And uh, uh, he came out of a building and saw Marilyn there and practically screamed um, that she had pursued him all the way to Orkney. <laughs> uh, as I was saying, it's, uh, in, in recent years, it's uh, Stuart Parker, uh, whose name Marilyn's is most uh, associated with, uh, first through her um, Stuart Parker, A Life, uh, um, and now as the editor of Hop Dance. Uh, Stuart Parker's previously 
um, unpublished novel, which uh, Marilyn has edited, and uh, which is a uh, publication date, I think, is the 12th? The 12th of May. Uh, it's what? But you can buy it now. Indeed, you can buy it now. You can buy it. Uh, Stephen Connolly is uh, conveniently holding up a, a copy of it at the back um, of the room, and you can... Um, you can buy many more of those uh, at the back of the room later on. Uh, Marilyn might also be um, the first uh, Fulbright scholar uh, to attend a Bristol City home match uh, willingly uh, on a Wednesday night uh, in the rain in February. Friday, but February. Yes. Friday, but February, and it was raining. Uh, Bristol City won 4 0 against Huddersfield Town. Um, so, would you please join me in welcoming the Bristol City tolerating, Arsenal supporting, Stuart Parker expert and just wonderful scholar, Marilyn Richtering. We're very glad to see all of you here tonight. Um, this is the first public airing of uh, Stuart Parker's novel, Hop Dance. And I want to tell you just a little bit about the book before I start reading. Um, as many or most of you know, Parker is best known as a playwright, um, one of the most inventive and accomplished Irish playwrights of the 20th century. Um, but early in his career, he defined himself as a poet and a writer of experimental prose. And Hop Dance dates to that time in his life, the early 1970s. Um, and when he drafted Hop Dance, Parker was trying not only to write something of literary value, but to come to terms with something that happened to him when he was 19 and a student at Queen's University Belfast, an undergraduate, he was diagnosed with a rare form of bone cancer. And at the time, the only treatment for this particular kind of cancer was removal of the diseased limb. So on the 17th of May, 1961, he, his left leg was amputated above the knee. Um, and when he, you know, he spent months in the hospital that summer, recovered at home after that, went back to Queens in the fall, determined to act as if this wasn't a big deal, a minor inconvenience. Um, and he threw himself back into his old activities to the best of his ability. Um, but he was haunted for a decade after that anyway, by the fear that the cancer would recur, which was a very real possibility. And finally, as he was approaching 30, he said to himself, you know, it is time to face squarely the fact that uh, I came this close to death. Um, and in, to have this experience as a 19-year-old gave him an early appreciation of something that most people come to accept at some point, uh, which is that we, aren't, we don't live forever. Um, but he did come to that awareness precociously. Um, and Hop Dance is a chronicle of that. Um, I should say as well that uh, Parker would have considered the novel unfinished. Um, when he wrote it in the early 1970s, he didn't try to publish it. He, he finished writing it and writing it, he was compelled to write it. He wasn't compelled to revise and publish it. Um, and at that time, he was trying to get his playwriting career off the ground. So this was a bigger priority for him. I think as well, he was probably worried about what his parents would make of it, um, since it focused on a time that was very stressful for them as well. So for, for whatever reason, he put it in a drawer. Um, but he always intended to finish it someday. Um, and in the summer of 1988, after Field Day produced his last play, Pentecost, he finally had a stretch of time where he had the leisure to pull it out again and work on it, and he really was determined then to finish it. Um, he had decided to add a few additional scenes, though he still liked what he had done in the 70s. You know, he had uh, other you know plans to revise it and work on it. 
Um, and in a terribly ironic twist, he was diagnosed then with a different kind of cancer, a stomach cancer that killed him within weeks. So this is the context of Hop Dance. Um, I read it first in 1994 as part of my research for the biography. Um, it was the only existing record of his private thoughts and feelings at that time. Um, and I drew on this quite a bit in the relevant chapters of that book. Um, but it seemed a shame to me that only a handful of people had ever had a chance to read it because it, I did believe it had literary as well as autobiographical value. So I asked his executor, Leslie Bruce, for permission to prepare the manuscript for publication. The structure of the novel is episodic. It's written in short scenes. Um, and these are not necessarily even chronological. There are, there are gaps throughout it, you know, just by nature of the way it's put together. So that, you know, he could slot additional scenes in and the novel could take them, but it could also do without them. Um, you know, it wasn't finished the way he would have liked to have finished it in the late 80s, but it was finished as it was finished in 1973. It still, I think, holds together. I invite you to read it and see what you think yourselves. Um, but I'm just going to read four short scenes or bits of scenes from the novel today. And this first scene is set the night before the amputation, um, which was the night that Stuart Parker learned and his alter ego in the novel, whose name is Tosh, learns that he's going to lose a leg the next morning. <laughs> this was the first inkling he had of that. When it was finally clear that he was alone, Tosh became filled with a profound calm. There was an almost inhuman clarity in his mind. His head felt rinsed. He was imbued with a limpid serenity. Unknown was the only word for what was facing him. It might be death, whatever that meant. It would certainly be some form of death. He pushed back the bedclothes and placed his left leg on top of them. He wouldn't be the same person after they took it away. A quarter of him would have disappeared. He studied the leg intently, memorizing it. From thigh to ankle, it looked sick and defeated with its wasted muscles and white hairlessness and the six inch vertical scar down the front crossed at intervals by stitch marks like a cartographer's railway line. But the foot clearly wanted to live. It was forlornly expressive, like an eager dog staring into the muzzle of its master's shotgun. Its nails were slightly yellowed and needed trimming. An ancient fossilized corn rounded out the smallest toe. It was obvious why feet had never ranked high in the aesthetics of the human anatomy. They were its faintly comic antipodes, its point of contact with the soil. For all that, there was a harmony of line and proportion at which Tosh marveled. He pondered on where they would take the leg, what they would do with it. Medical students would practice on it, probably. At any rate, it would have preceded the other three quarters of his ailing animal into the purely vegetable and mineral existence of dead matter. Or into the consciousness of which all matter partakes. Or into a spot from which it could conveniently fly out to be reunited with its hip on the day of judgment. It was generally assumed that a faith in such convictions was essential to face ordeals of suffering and death with equanimity. 
Yet Tosh felt entirely composed and certain of nothing except for his own blind ignorance. The only resource he was aware of was the voice in his head itself, the fact of his own consciousness. And it was telling him that tomorrow, when the knife and the saw went in, it itself would be drowned in gristle and blood, and then he would have no resources at all. The fear created by such a prospect was an experience which entirely transcended the familiar everyday emotion, which had frequently loosened his bowels and dried his mouth. It was a state of emotional refrigeration, which had created the almost preternatural calm in which his thoughts were ordering themselves so composedly. He was aware of taking pleasure in the rational processes of his mind for the first time in his life, just as he had perceived the shapeliness of the human foot for the first time. He would be deprived of both of these attributes tomorrow morning. His life had been remarkable to nobody but himself up to this point, and to him it had been a fretted, directionless affair, crowded with other people whom he could never know, who rose and fell like skittles in their unhappy dealings with one another and with him. That existence was at its solitary climax now for him, and for them it was already over. If they ever saw him again, he would not be the same person. He had a powerful sense of having reached the end of his growing. The growth was cankered. If the canker could be excised, he would have arrived at last at the unknown life which he was destined to live. It would be his own life, and he would have to live it with whatever resources were available. In the meantime, a wave as tall as a ship was creeping soundlessly towards him over the dark water. When I say this is a book about mortality, that might not make it sound like a lot of fun. Um, but Parker was wonderfully able to find humor in almost any situation. And a lot of the humor in this novel comes from his treatment of Tosh. Um, he was very influenced in writing this book by James Joyce's A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. And one of the things he had in common with Joyce was the ability to look unsparingly, you know, objectively, at his younger self, who, despite moments of insight like the one I've read, remains pretty clueless in many ways throughout the novel, um, especially when it comes to his dealings with the opposite sex. He spends most of the book mooning after women who are unattainable, um, while treating his actual girlfriend with dismissive impatience. <laughs> um, and this is, uh, there are, there's a whole sequence of these women in the novel. This is one little section of the book about a girl called Cora, who he had become friendly with, you know, long before the amputation, but they kind of renewed their friendship in the aftermath. Cora called, to rehabilitate you. She had the right idea up to a point. Others offered books and concern or a drive in the country. She offered her warm flesh up to a point. First you were too reluctant, then you were too ardent. It seemed a long time before that he'd given up on Cora. But she had been to the hospital several times. She was working in social welfare now. That was the reason for the reluctance. She carried on a cheerful, serene intercourse with the world at large. Her earthiness was unconscious. Her progress down the road of motherhood and respectable affluence, steadfast and not to be impeded. 
There was no forgetting their first encounter. It had been the end of a dance, swollen heavy with shadows and the accumulated spore of the evening. He had seen her come in with a friend. Her head was a cluster of blonde curls, and she had an aura of physical unconcern, slightly overweight and dressed without guile. In the midst of such ruthless calculation, he homed in on her. She laughed a lot. She was relaxed with herself. And as they mooned around the floor, she held his left hand in such a way that the tip of the thumb brushed back and forward, back and forward, across the nipple of her right breast. It was a piece of absent-minded sensuality that inflamed and delighted him more than any provocative deliberation ever could. He clowned and capered for her and was ready to throw in his lot with her, surrender any plans or principles in return for a lifetime of such blithe unawareness. But she was promised to a pilot and was only filling in the time till he got his wings and could marry her. Tosh found this situation hilarious. He treasured Cora for her inability to take him seriously. For a while, he thought he might be edging the pilot out of the picture, but their marital union became clearly more ineluctable, and Tosh finally stopped seeing a lot of Cora with the same equanimity that had governed their friendship from the first night at the dance. She came in her car to inveigle him off to the pictures. Too much awkward struggling, he said. But without apparent effort, she had him in the car, in coat and scarf. She chided all of his weak complaints. Actually, I really wanted to go pony trekking, he said, when they were finally seated in the cinema. She smiled up into his face, her eyes swimming with laughter, and closed her loosely smiling mouth on his, the dark kiss entering his blood like alcohol. Then she thrust her head into his neck, embracing him loosely, and they spent the film joking and nuzzling like youngsters on a first date. By the time she had him home again, he felt more alive than he had since leaving the hospital. She called often after that, in her loose summer cotton dresses and bare white legs. She had an almost slatternly look that made him long to be naked with her in the sun, to lose the stasis and morbidity of his life in the strenuous, joyful benediction of love play, the joyful tumult of sweat and flesh. However, as he remarked in a letter to his friend Harrison, when making a pass involves struggling onto your foot, clamping a pair of crutches to your forearms, humping across the room, lowering yourself carefully down on the sofa beside the woman, detaching the crutches and putting them aside, you'll understand that cool, suave sexuality is beyond me. She would always come to him establishing an easy physical bond as soon as she arrived, settling down on the ground in front of his chair, arms spread across his lap. Then he would kiss and caress her. But these preliminaries were all she would allow him. As in their original period of intimacy, the shadow of the pilot fell between them. Tosh was bemused, arrested in the middle of an erotic overture by Cora's admission that the pilot had laid down what she might and might not do in her relations with Tosh. Her ministrations were spontaneous and sincere, but equally they were professional. And that rankled with Tosh when she wasn't there and his mind would work things over with carnivorous thoroughness. He, she loved him, 
She was a welfare officer. She loved all the lame ducks within her discernment in a cheerful, unconsidered way. It wasn't enough. He was grateful to her. She stopped coming round after he moved into the flat with Harrison. One of the first effects of the amputation is to make Taj horribly self-conscious. Um, an adolescent doesn't need uh, much reason to feel self-conscious, <laughs> um, but that was certainly more than reason enough. He feels like a complete freak. And the novel opens with um, a scene in which he sees himself in a mirror for the first time. Um, after the surgery. This is with me some weeks later. One day they said, it's time you went to the gymnasium, Mr. Tosh. And so you go there, whistling even, a shanty of sorts, trying to fancy yourself aboard ship along these long corridors with the curvy low ceilings a male nurse in his white smock, smiling past like a cabin steward, polished floor, the right crutch sliding a little, easy. On a real ship, on these things, with one bound you'd be on your arse, all at sea. There now, wordplay even, of a sort. The boy is back in his mind again, tunneling left, that must be the place. Swing doors with portholes, eases his right shoulder between the doors, bundling through in an awkward scuffle the hospital gymnasium. Bars, ropes, curious engines. Nobody here yet, heeling round to starboard. A spectral stranger in the corner, lurking there eyeing you out of a ragged thicket of dirty, fair hair, lank blue jumper hanging limp on the bony shoulders, metal crutches clamping the forearms, fixing you with that glittering eye, transfixed, don't look down, gross blue knot dangling in the vacant space where the left leg should be, pajama knot, dangling from the blunt stump, fat with its bandages, the one fat thing, gorged full on its own blood, first sight of it, first mirror. Easy. As others see me, scary ghost, sad freak, no wonder they tried to make you wear their long tartan dressing gown, get a haircut, stay in the ward, spare the feelings of the healthy. No wonder horrified eyes sliding sideways as they pass me in the corridor, motionless, holding the stare. For the slightest move, confirmed by the mirror, will force him at length to identify with that halt Scarecrow, which now at last stands there revealed to him after the months of living wholly inside that stricken mask. Caught. Look. Gradually, though, you know, as I say, he feels sort of uniquely singled out by fate um, by this uh, diagnosis and what happens afterwards. But gradually, as he recovers from the surgery, um, he starts to recognize that what has happened to him doesn't make him different from everyone else, it makes him like everyone else. That what uh, most of the time people choose to focus on the things that they don't have in common, um, which pale in comparison to this fact of mortality, this big thing, 
they do share. And the scenes uh, set at the limb fitting center where Tosh goes to be fitted for his prosthetic leg, um, there is a, a succession of these in the novel. These especially crystallize this theme. This is his first visit, the beginning of his first visit to the limb fitting center. Entering was like a beggar's burlesque of royalty. Little bald men, a vivid tracery of fine red veins on their noses and cheekbones, stood about in the hallway behind the smudged glass and tarnished brass of the doors. As Tosh swung slowly up on his crutches, two of them, their dark blue livery misshapen on their bodies like arthritic fingers, sprang to the doors and whipped them solemnly open. He proceeded majestically through to the middle of the dusty hall, and a third attendant stepped forward out of the gloom. Is it limbs, sir? he asked respectfully. Tosh nodded. Third floor. There's the lift there. This way, sir. It was the voice of yet another attendant calling from the dark corner where a cage door clearly gave access to a lift. The lift had a single bare bulb screwed to the ceiling and all the symptoms of asthma. When the third floor was gained, the lift man threw the lever back and forth, the lift shuddering up and down till its floor was level with the floor outside. Then he threw back the metal door with an impressive clang and flourish. Have you been here before, sir? Do you know where to go? No, said Tosh. Just follow that corridor till you see the waiting room. There's a sign outside it. The wee girl in there will look after you. Tosh launched himself down the corridor. There was a door marked eye fitting, then one marked limb workshop. Coming towards him were two white coated figures leading by the hand between them a child of five or six. The child had a strap over his shoulder and a waist belt holding on what looked like metal calipers on his right leg, except that there was no leg. The metal frame terminated in a punch-shaped block of wood instead of a foot. The child was bawling and the two men murmuring to him in a kindly way. They continued murmuring as they nodded to Tosh in passing. Ahead, there was another corridor joining from the left. At the junction, a large bunch of artificial legs were stacked upright. Some were a maidenly pink, and others had the look of a synthetic suntan. He had seen photographs of artificial legs stacked just like them at Auschwitz and Belsen, along with everything else that could be removed from the bodies of gassed Jews, it had been somehow more disturbing than even the shaven, spindly body spooks. Why so? A kind of human refuse, detritus of bottles and tin cans in the white sands of a desert. On his right, he saw the waiting room and swung into it. It was small and narrow, dingy armchairs along each side with half a dozen men in them. At the end, under a window, in front of a radiator, facing him, in a wheelchair, there sat half a man. He had a large gnarled head. He looked at least a hundred years old. His body came to an end just below his buttocks. In the side wall, near to this man, there was a window hatch with a handwritten sign, Enquiries, jotting out. Tosh picked his way towards this between the parallel lines of feet. A woman appeared at the window hatch after he had knocked on it. She took his name and told him to sit down. He chose the nearest end chair, its seat and back greasily dark with use, a small round table beside it strewn with torn pages of aged women's magazines. 
Nobody was talking in the room. He scanned the line of feet opposite. One foot of each pair sat cocked on its heel at an odd angle. In two cases, a shiny brown patch of leg visible above the top of the sock contrasted oddly with the hairy whiteness of the corresponding patch alongside it. By these signs shall we be known. Tosh raised his eyes discreetly and scrutinized the faces. A young red-haired country boy a heavy set man with hair in his nostrils, a thin old man with violet strings of veins across the backs of his hands. It had not occurred to him till now that he was a member of a Freemasonry. A novice arrived for initiation. <laughs> <laughs>